Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Scary Stories, with your host, the Creepy Fox. Tonight, join me for some true scary Home Alone stories that are going to chill you to the bone. Speaking of which, I want to give a very special thank you and shout out to fellow narrator, Bad Vibe Storytelling, who joined me on today's episode. He's really awesome. And if you haven't already checked out his channel, you can find a link to it in the description below. Just like myself, he narrates scary stories that I know you're going to love. Tell him Caesar the Creepy Fox sent you. Anyways, friends, let's go ahead and jump into it. Hope you enjoy. Home Alone in Tijuana Back in 2002, I decided to visit my tío y mi tía for Christmas. In this little community, everyone knows each other, and it was very common for the kiddos to be out late. Even the homeowners left their doors and windows unlocked, mostly because it was hot and no one had air conditioning. Unfortunately, in the years that I've been to Tijuana, there has been an uptick of crime. All you have to do is look it up yourself. That's why I recommend if you do go, stay in the more populated areas and avoid being out at night, especially if you're alone. Sorry, I don't mean to sidetrack. I just wanted to quickly bring that up for anyone who's looking to travel there. Anyways, I stayed there for a total of a week, and on the third or fourth day of my visit, I had something happen to me that was so scary, so downright frightening. I honestly hope none of you ever have to experience it firsthand. So, what exactly happened on that evening? Well, what occurred was my tío and tía heading to the supermarket to go and grab some groceries. They did ask me if I wanted to join them, but I was being lazy. You see, I would brought my Game Boy Color with me, and I was grinding in Pokemon Gold so I could challenge and beat Red. I only remember that detail because I was actually able to defeat him on the plane trip back to Georgia. At any rate, they had left at about 6pm, promising to be back in about an hour, and I was laying in bed in the guest bedroom. After approximately 20 minutes of playing, I could feel my eyes begin to grow heavy. You see, I'd woken up early that day to help my uncle feed his goats, and I was already beginning to grow sleepy. Therefore, I decided to take a quick nap in the hopes it would make the time pass faster and my family would return. Fast forward another 30 to 40 minutes and I was awoken by the sound of something crashing onto the floor. I would later determine the cause of the noise being a vase falling over, but that would be the least of the troubles. Anywho, I laid in bed telling myself it was my tío and tía returning from the grocery store just laid there waiting for them to tell me dinner would be ready, so I could get up. Here's the thing. I couldn't hear my tío or tía, but I could hear footsteps shuffling in the various rooms, including the living room, the kitchen, and my tío and tía's room. Now, these footsteps sounded rushed and panicked, and it's at this moment I began thinking that something was terribly wrong. Could it have been that someone... Or even worse, some ones had broken into the house? My heart began racing thinking of that thought, as my priority was to get up and lock the door. Unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to do that, because as I roll out of bed, I see shoes just outside the guest bedroom, through the bottom crack. I feared that if I got up, I wouldn't have enough time to run over to the door, and whoever was in here would have most likely entered and spotted me. I went for the next best thing. As quickly and as quietly as I could, I grabbed my Game Boy Color as some sort of self-defense tool, and I rolled under the bed. Looking back, it's hilarious imagining me with a Game Boy, ready to smack someone over the head with it. Literally seconds later, the door busts open, and my worst nightmare comes to life. Standing in the doorway were two large men brandishing handguns and a duffel bag. I could feel my body go numb as I watched in complete disbelief. As the two men started to ransack my suitcase, as well as the dressers and the drawers, 
This seemed to go on for what felt like an eternity, but was really only about 30 to 45 seconds. Perhaps what really scared me the most, however, was the final part when one of them dropped some jewelry that fell next to the bed. One of them then proceeded to bend over and grab it. I feared that they would have spotted me, but luckily, they didn't bother looking in my direction. Finally, they left my room, and I laid there silently until I could no longer hear their footsteps and whispering. I started to whimper, and I held back tears for the next 15 minutes as I laid there thinking they would return. That never happened. Instead, I heard my tío and tía, and my tío yelled my name, asking why their vase was broken. I finally got the courage to roll out from under the bed, and I met them in the hallway, where I proceeded to run into my tía's arms, and I started to bawl. Sadly, it seemed my tío didn't believe my story at first, but as my tío started to look into the rooms and notice jewelry and cash missing, he finally listened. My tío proceeded to call the police, who arrived 20 minutes later, and as we're talking on the porch, one of the neighbors comes over and asked what had happened. He tells the police he had seen two men in large jackets storm out the back of my family's home with a duffel bag, where they then proceeded to drive off in an unmarked minivan. Unfortunately, they were never caught, and the money and jewelry that was stolen was never returned. So here we are, all these years later. My tío and my tía have now moved to Texas, where they live a quiet and peaceful life. As for me, I moved to Montana, got married, and I have two beautiful daughters. They're actually the ones who introduced me to you, and I must say I really enjoy the narrations you put out, Creepy Fox. I'd love to hear you narrate this so my daughters can get a huge surprise next time they listen to you. I'll make sure to share their reactions. Anyways, friend, be well, be safe, and I can't wait to see your next Aria Rose animation. As an anime fan, I love what you're doing, so keep it up. Hearing the Home Alone stories the Creepy Fox puts out on his channel reminds me of a time that I had something happen to me. For quick context, I'm male, and this was in 2008. I was home alone, having only my pet cockatiel, Elvis, keeping me company while I sat in my room working on some digital artwork. The time was roughly 10 p.m. There was light rain falling outside my window, and I had some classical music playing on my iPod. I was also sipping on some hot chocolate with a couple of marshmallows melted in my drink, which added to the already delicious flavor I also adore. As for Elvis, he was sitting on my desk next to the mouse pad sleeping, using his fluffy feathers on his back as a makeshift pillow. So far, everything was relatively quiet and peaceful. Occasionally, the sound of thunder in the distance did startle Elvis and I, but it was quickly dismissed. Anyways, I was interrupted from my work when I started hearing knocking on my front door. This spooked Elvis out of his slumber and he crawled onto my arm and then finally to my shoulder. I lowered the volume on my iPod thinking I was maybe imagining the noise and I started listening more intently. It then was quiet for about 10 seconds, thus I thought my assumptions were correct. But then the knocking is back. Now, my parents were away this weekend, and unless they had magically driven two hours back home without advising me via a phone call or a text message, then who could have been outside my home? After all, it's late, it's raining, and it's borderline freezing. Anyone would have been crazy to be caught in that downpour. Well, there were the neighbors, but I would have thought they would have called first, at least you would think. At any rate, I got up from my desk, Elvis on my shoulder accompanied me, like a parrot does with a pirate, and we slowly began our tiptoe walk to the front of the house. Hello, pizza delivery, is anyone home? This was the first time under these bizarre moments that I could finally hear a voice. Pizza, the voice claimed that they had a pizza. But let's stop to think for a moment, I never ordered a pizza that night, and even if I did, I wouldn't eat that late anyways. I'm sorry, but you got the wrong house. No pizza ordered. 
No, I have your address written right here. You have to pay for it. I started to get a bit nervous as I peeked through the peephole. Elvis softly pecking at my ear as if to warn me about the immediate danger and what I see sent shivers down my spine. There's what appears to be a man, long hair, hat, large stained oversized jacket, jeans. He was standing there with a look of hatred on his face. I saw no pizza box, but that's not what scared me. What did was the knife in his dirty hands. I stepped back from the door, my breathing beginning to grow uncomfortable as I shout out the first thing I could think of. This is more or less what I said. Cops are already on the way. Get out of here now. I have a shotgun, and if you try to get in, I'll blast you into a million pieces. Poor Elvis. He got spooked in my sudden fit of rage as I saw the feathers on his head stand straight up, but it seemed like my outburst had worked. I looked at the peephole again as the man put the knife into his jacket, then did a complete 180 and walked away. Immediately, I started to check all the doors and windows to make sure they were locked, half expecting the creep to meet me at one of them, but thankfully that doesn't happen. Once I know I'm safe and everything's secured, I call 911 and explain to them that there was a man with a knife outside my home and they needed to get the police there right away. Fast forward to when the police got there. The man was long gone, but I went ahead and gave him the best description I could, regardless. Unfortunately, they never caught the guy, and I haven't heard any updates since that evening. Whether or not this dude was actually serious about his intentions, or maybe he was just playing a prank, I will never know. Anyone have an idea? To catch a burglar. Looking back on this, I do find it more bizarre than anything. I thought I'd share it with you all, to see what you all think. At the time, this being in the early 2000s, I was in the process of moving out of my parents' home. Seeing as I was 30, it was about time to move. Things should have started off fairly smoothly. Move in, get accustomed to the neighbors and the scenery, and just work and live my life. Too bad it wasn't that way at the start. Now let me just very quickly describe the locale of where my home was. I was living in a small town in middle America, where the largest accumulation of people would be at the local Walmart. I swear any time I was shopping on a Friday night you'd see half the townsfolk. Speaking of the townsfolk, my nearest neighbor was at least a half a mile away. I only want to bring this context up so you get a basic understanding of what I'm dealing with. Life being quiet, mundane, and apart from going shopping, you don't really talk to people. So, back to moving in. Since I was in the process of moving, having furniture and movers in and out of the house, the doors were left open for most of the day. I didn't take issue since I was there as it was happening, and again, the lack of people. I want to say it was the third or fourth day of the move, and I was in the backyard attending to the rose garden I planted in honor of my late wife. I can still remember it being a warm 80 degrees as my sun-kissed skin could feel the tingling of the rays shining upon me and the sweat dripped down my brow as I realized I could use a water break. I looked over to my water bottle, but I noticed it was empty. So I got up, dirt falling from my knees which stuck to me from the sweat and I start to make my way to the back door in the kitchen. As soon as I'm in, I get the immediate satisfaction of the air conditioning, which was such a relief after being outside for almost an hour. This relief would only be temporary, because I ended up hearing something. What exactly am I referring to, you might be asking yourself. Footsteps, coming from the second story. I had to do a double take, if you will because I thought perhaps the movers were still working, but they weren't supposed to get there until later in the evening. So what's the cause? I grabbed a kitchen knife, seeing as I was, and still am the paranoid type, and I step into my living room. That's where the staircase is. I start to inch my way up each step, wood is squeaking and echoing through the empty house as I heard the footsteps go silent. My heart was racing at a million miles an hour 
half expecting that my place might have been haunted, and I was going to stumble into a ghost. It's at this moment I became so paranoid. I told myself a knife wouldn't be enough. I would grab my shotgun from the gun safe, just in case I was dealing with some sort of home intruder. That safe, being located in my bedroom by the way. I quickly grabbed it, nerves at an all-time high. And as I'm returning back to the second story hallway, I heard something tip over in the guest bedroom. I quickly raced over, like a soldier in Call of Duty, and as I kicked the door in, I bump into a person in a hoodie and a balaclava going through my closet. Oh, I thought nobody was home, the man said, as he stuttered and started to shake. You have five seconds to drop what you're doing and get out of my home, or this will be the last thing you see. I scared that man out of his wits. I escorted him out of my house, shotgun still in my grasps, and he runs off into the nearby woods. I then heard a car engine and watched as a minivan took off. I was left in absolute shock. The audacity. The absolute audacity of this home burglar to not only assume the house was empty, but to even break in to begin with. Yes, maybe it was partially my fault I left the door unlocked since I was expecting the movers to come, but I shouldn't have had to worry about this. The movers did arrive a couple of hours later, and naturally I did inquire about the home burglar from earlier. They had no clue of what I spoke of, not that I was really surprised. I did get into contact with a friend of mine who worked at the police station, but unfortunately they never found him. However, I think I might have scared him so much that he decided to retire from his days of burglary, as in the years I continued to live there, I never had anything like that happen to me again. By the way, I pretty much converted that home into the equivalent of Fort Knox as I ended up getting two amazing German shepherds and an alarm system that was installed into my home. I guess that's some advice I could give to you all. It doesn't matter where you live. You better make sure you're prepared. Whether it be cameras, security systems, dogs, you name it. Make sure those burglars and home intruders don't have any opportunities to break in. Edit. I forgot to put this in the beginning, but I now live in Juneau, Alaska. So creepy fox. If you're ever in the area, feel free to hit me up. I can tell you all about the amazing food places we have, as well as even offer some insight to the amazing places that you can film here. The Missing Key This isn't necessarily a story about being home alone, but it does involve my house, and it's just as scary as any other experience you might have heard. This was about four years ago, when my girlfriend and I moved into our new home in a rural West Virginian town. As we started getting used to our new life, we began to become aware of some strange happenings. There was one evening when myself and my girlfriend were in the backyard having a barbecue. At some point, I remember my girlfriend getting up to get some napkins from the kitchen and that's when she ends up hearing something. You see, we have an attic with one of those old squeaky doors that makes a distinguishable sound when it's opened. Not only does she hear the sound of it opening, but she also heard the sounds of footsteps making their way to the bottom floor. Where our kitchen was located, you were unable to see the staircase that leads to the second story. You could, however, see the living room from where she was standing. But in order to see the stairs, you would have to walk into the living room. Either way, my girlfriend froze when she heard what sounded like the front door opening. Immediately, she returned outside to explain what she had heard and what had happened. Together, we make our way inside the house, only to find what I had just mentioned. Not only was her front living door open, but the attic was as well. Instantly, we call it in, and an officer joins us to check our house. After about half an hour of searching, the officer takes our statements and advises my girlfriend and I they would do some extra patrols, but in the meantime to be cautious, vigilant, 
and to ensure all doors and windows are locked. Now, it is important to note that before this incident, my girlfriend had lost her house key at work. I told her to grab the extra key from the planter that we had next to our front door, and then I put mine in the planter to replace it. I never checked up on that key again, and this was a very big mistake. This is important, by the way. Fast forward a week later, my girlfriend ends up calling the police after returning from her job earlier than normal. I was still at work, mind you, but I became concerned when I noticed all the missed calls on my phone. I listened in to one of the messages, and it said, Honey, can you please call me back when you can? This is really important. See, what happened was as soon as she got home, she noticed some muddy footprints on the front lawn. They seemed to be making their way to the back of the house. That's when she ended up following them. When she reached the backyard, she now notices the footprints lead to the door. Sure enough, it's unlocked. Even the screen was slashed. Realizing someone might have broken in, my girlfriend goes back to her car and waits until help arrived. Carefully, the police make their way in, and less than 10 minutes later, they have a man in handcuffs. Turns out there was a junkie hiding in the attic who had a hold of our spare key, the one I placed in the planter. Sure enough, when I checked myself, it was gone. It's crazy. Crazy to think he was most likely staking out our home and must have realized the extra key was in the planter. But that's not the worst part. The guy was in possession of a knife. What he planned on doing, we don't know. It's scary to think he had access to her house with that missing key. My advice to all of you, don't make the same mistake like me. Instead of leaving your spare key under a doormat or even in a planter, consider this instead. If you can trust your neighbor, have them be in possession of a spare key. If not, a family member that might live close by. If you have none of those, then I'm not really sure what to tell you. Get creative and keep that house of yours safe. The sirens were the least of my troubles. Hey there, my creepy fox friend, how's it going? I'm an older fan of yours. I'm 45 years old. I've also been listening to you since roughly November 2017, and I've really enjoyed seeing your channel grow to what it is today. In all my time listening, I keep telling myself I'll share my home alone story, and every time I keep putting it off. Well, no more procrastination. I finally have a break from work and the kiddos. So let me share my scary home alone story. This was back in the late 1990s. I was a college student, your average ordinary kid, who liked to hang out at the arcades and go bowling with the friends. When I wasn't doing that, I was either on campus or in my room studying and cramming for midterms. Here I found myself doing that, this one December's evening, enjoying the peace and quiet that comes with being at home by yourself. I had the radio on low, playing some old classics, and I must have been studying for math or something, when I started to notice the annoying sounds of helicopters. I wrote this off as a normal occurrence. I was living near an airport, so naturally there's air traffic, but I couldn't take it anymore when this was joined by police sirens. It started off fairly distant, but the louder it got, the more distracting and difficult it became to study. My curiosity was telling me to go and see if perhaps I might be able to spot some sort of action. Therefore, I used this opportunity to stretch from sitting down all that evening, and I make my way over to the living room, police sirens getting louder and closer. As I'm about to open the curtains, I can see red and blue lights shining through the cracks. I rip open the curtains, revealing one of the most intense sights I'd seen up to that point. I just catch the glimpse of a large hooded figure run by my window, heading toward the backyard. A couple of police officers were chasing after him. So that's what it was all about, I said to myself. A police chase. I run like a cheetah heading toward the back room which has a clear view of my backyard, and that's when something else scary takes place. The hooded figure 
is trying to open the back door, which has no curtains and no coverings. I froze there like an ice cube, as just seconds later the guy puts his hands up and the police are telling him to get down to the floor. How I wish this was during a time when cell phones were available, because I would have loved to have shared that moment, even all these years later I can play it in my head like it was yesterday. Anyways, I ended up speaking with the police, where there's easily about 10 police cruisers parked outside my home, red and blue lights shining, and neighbors watching from their front lawns. It was a little later I learned the man had robbed a liquor store, stolen a vehicle, and was considered to be armed and dangerous. Talk about unexpected and downright scary. Just imagine being in my shoes. Chances are, even the strongest willed of you out there would have gotten the chills. Charles the Cat Warns of Burglar This happened well over seven years ago, so pardon me if I'm not all that great with the details. I'm doing the best I can between myself and my then boyfriend's memory. For some context, I'm female, and I was 27 years old at the time of this incident. I live in North Dakota, by the way. This was on one of my days off from work, and I had been laying in bed for most of the afternoon, resting up from a cold that I had picked up. Keeping me company was my pet cat Charles, who is a Norwegian forest cat breed and is the biggest sweetheart you'll ever meet. He never leaves my side. Now I did mention my boyfriend, now husband, who we're going to call Anthony. He was working as a security guard and was gone during the evenings. This included the evening and afternoon that I had been resting up in bed. Anthony told me that during his lunch break, at roughly 8 p.m., he was going to drive to the grocery store and bring me some soup and bread to help with my appetite. Therefore, I was eagerly awaiting his arrival. Fast forward to his lunch break, and my boyfriend calls to ask which soup I wanted. I told him chicken noodle soup, and asked if he could also bring me a piece of garlic bread, and he agrees, saying he would be home to drop it off in about 20 minutes. Nice. I started to roll out of bed, Charles jumping to the carpet and letting out some of his cute meows as he follows me to the restroom so I could quickly wash my face. It's while waiting for the water to warm up and looking at my Instagram, I heard what sounds like scratching on a screen. We do live in a very quiet neighborhood and there are these large trees by my window, so I assumed it was a squirrel or bird, since oftentimes Charles would sit on the windowsill and watch them. Once I was done with washing, I head toward the staircase. I was on the second story, and I make my way to the first floor. I'm then heading down a hallway, which requires me to pass by the living room. Now here's the thing. There is a window in the living room, where normally on nights you can see the moon, the light shines into the hallway. I had Charles in my arms, and as I inched my way closer, Charles begins to hiss, and his hair on his back is standing up. I could see the shadow is parting the light, and it looks like it's moving. This freaked me out a bit, but to calm my nerves I take a quick peek into the living room, and then toward the window. I let out a yelp. There's some large hooded figure cutting the screen on the window. I immediately jump back into the cover of darkness as I take one look at Charles, and he's having more or less the same reaction as me. We run back to my room, where the first thing I did was lock the door, and then put a chair underneath the door handle. I had two options, call the cops, or call my boyfriend. I ended up doing both. First I called my boyfriend, and I told him there was someone outside the living room with a knife trying to make their way in. Anthony told me he was just about to reach the grocery store when I called. He told me he was on the way, but in the meantime, I was to call the police. Bear in mind, my boyfriend was only about five minutes from our home. Once I hung up, I heard footsteps, and this revelation was what really set the mood, as I dialed 911, hands shaking and palms sweating. Hello? I need 
need police here, right away. Someone's in my house, and I can hear them moving furniture and opening drawers. I whispered as I grabbed the shotgun underneath the bed and then proceeded to hide in the closet. Charles refused to join me in there. He kept scratching at the door and hissing as if to play hero and protect his owner. I finally got him to come back to me, but not before I hear the footsteps stop at my door and the door handle begins to rattle. I'm trying all I can to hold back tears as the operator is telling me to remain calm and quiet so that the intruder wouldn't hear me. I had the shotgun pointed at the door, ready to blast whoever entered my room into the shadow realm. Yes, I said shadow realm for those who get the reference. After what seemed like an eternity was honestly only about 10 seconds of doorknob moving, I hear a car door open and then close. The doorknob grew silent, and I could hear whoever was in my home begin to make their way down the hallway. Moments later, I can hear the front door opening, and Anthony is telling this guy to get down to the floor. Anthony has a concealed carry, in case you're wondering. Then, as if things couldn't get any better, I look out the window, and I could see red and blue lights. It was the police. Three cars, to be exact. Five officers jumped out of the vehicles, and I quickly opened the window, and I advised them about my boyfriend having a pistol, but that there was an intruder inside her home. When all was said and done, the police ended up handcuffing and arresting a 40-something-year-old man, who indeed had a knife like I'd witnessed only minutes earlier. I am so thankful to this day for Charles and his intuition. Had he not made the abnormal noises and movements and led me on to see the shadow moving in the hallway, things could have turned out so much worse. I guess I should also take this opportunity to thank not only Anthony, but those police officers. You're all the best, and I owe you all a huge hug. I'm happy to say not only did Charles get extra treats and toys, but he continues to live a wonderful and peaceful life with Anthony and I who got married just last year. We're planning on having a baby next year, once things hopefully get better. Stalker fan took it too far. I want to share this story with you, but I do ask you that you don't mention my name for privacy reasons. Although this was about five years ago, and I've now moved on in my life, there was a time when for a while things were pretty scary. For context, I'm currently 30, but I was 25 during these events. I'm also female. I was part of an all-girls band, which I'd formed in my latter half of college, which I was the vocalist of. We weren't really much popular, just a cover band where we played at local bars and coffee shops. Over a period of a year, we started to gain fans and our pages on social media slowly started to rise from the single digits into the hundreds. Whenever we would play at one of our favorite bars, we'd have meetups with fans in which we'd take pictures and play games. I think that's the one thing I really enjoyed about our group being the size it was. I feel like when people get really popular, they forget about the ones who helped support them and climb that mountain. Even so, Sometimes you get those types of fans that take things a little too far. That is, if you really want to refer to them as fans. There was this one woman, she was in her mid-fifties, single from what I was able to learn, who first started by approaching me one evening when we were playing and asking if I could give her a hug. A strange request, but she seemed kind enough, so I offered one. That was one of the longest hugs I'd ever had. She wasn't letting go, and it took one of my bandmates to tell her to stop. She apologized, and then proceeded to ask if I could take a picture with her. I did, although the way she held me in her arms was pretty awkward, kind of what you would expect from a couple or some lovers. After that, I distanced myself from her, and any time I did see her, I would pretend to be busy. I know it sounds kind of mean, 
but it's like my instincts were telling me there was something very wrong. I was right, because after a month that I had met her and seen her at the bar, the requests and messages had begun. You see, we had stopped playing for a while since I was visiting some family overseas. This lady had found my personal Facebook, one I never advertise, since I had a stage name. She began sending multiple requests and then even found my personal Instagram and messaged me there too. She asked where I was and why I hadn't been playing at the bar. I ignored those messages and I blocked her. But she just ended up making a new account and doing the same thing. I was starting to get pretty creeped out by it, but it seemed ignoring her had worked. At least, I thought so. Fast forward a week after I got him back home. I was relaxing in my bathtub, listening to an audiobook from one of my favorite authors. When I see a notification on my phone from Instagram, it was an account I didn't follow that had sent me a photo. I was curious. I opened it, and what I saw sent shivers down my spine. It's what appears to be my home, along with the message. Hey, I think I found your home. Are you there right now? Mind if I come in? I have some cookies I baked you. I knew who it was. I was dealing with the stalker fan. I remember going into a panic as I told her she had the wrong house to which she then proceeded to call me out on my lie. I'll save you the language she used, since it was pretty vulgar. But one thing she said, in the following image, is what made me call the police. She sent a picture of a knife. She said that if I didn't open the door, she would make her way in by force. Boy, let me tell you, she sure tried. Because I started to hear knocking on the windows. Here I was, in the bathtub soaked with cherry blossom scented bubbles, about to have a full-on bit of rage as I grabbed my towel and then my phone. I'll save you all the details since what happens next is just me hiding in the bathroom, hearing footsteps outside my home, and me getting notifications from the woman. When the police got there, they found the woman hiding underneath my back porch. And yes, she did have a knife. Yeah, can you believe she actually broke into my backyard? Sure, I guess. She didn't actually get into my home. But still, she hopped over my fence and was most likely waiting for me to open the front door so that she could get in. So I'm calling this a home invasion story just for that detail. Anyways, they located her vehicle further down the road where they found some duct tape, rope, and a bunch of my pictures that were taken from my Facebook I still don't know how she found me, but as I look back, not having a private Facebook or Instagram, she might have used some of my posts, as well as their locations, in order to get a basic idea of where I lived. Since then, I have a restraining order, and I've moved across the country, and have even legally changed my name. All my social media from before is now deleted. Even now that I'm married and have a wonderful husband who is a police officer, I can't help but get scared sometimes when he's not there. Our home is armed to the T, by the way, and we have a wonderful pet bull named Tommy. But still, that doesn't stop the nightmares I have sometimes, where she actually breaks into my home. In my backyard. So this technically isn't a home invasion story, but it does involve an evening I was home alone, and it's pretty creepy. It was earlier this year, in April, prime time of the lockdown. I was watching WWE Smackdown, munching on some popcorn with a can of Sprite to wash it down as my dachshund Amber laid beside me. Now for those who don't have dachshunds or are unfamiliar with the breed, let me mention this detail. Trust me, it's relevant to the story, and you might learn something new. Dachshunds are one of the cutest breeds of dogs you can ever have. Whether it be those long snouts, the funny faces they make when you give them belly rubs, or just the way they sleep beside you, they're adorable. But they have a very mean side to them. And when I say mean, I'm talking and dachshunds can and will attack if provoked. Trust me, 
You might think you're high and mighty, but a dachshund doesn't care. They'll go after you if they think you're problematic. I feel bad for the mailman. He always gets barked at, but at least it advises me of when the mail gets here. So how is this important to my story? Well, about an hour into Smackdown, I just returned from the kitchen, where I gave Amber one of her favorite beef jerky treats. She was in there enjoying her meal as I stood next to the couch waiting for her to return. I didn't want to get up again, since she likes to pick her spot first, and then I just sit next to her. That's why I'm standing up. Well, about 20 seconds since I had seen her, I can hear her do those little woof sounds she makes when the mailman is getting closer to my home. I still don't know how she can even sense them, but I guess it's a dog thing. Now, I do live near some woods and we do get wildlife occasionally, and that's why I made the assumption she was sensing that. After all, it's past 9pm, and the latest the mailman has delivered mail to me is like 7pm. From the living room, I tell her it's okay, and to relax, but then, she goes absolutely crazy. She starts barking up a storm, even more than she does with the mailman. The way I could best put it, it's like she was ready to tear someone into bit-sized shreds. So, I head to the kitchen to see what's the big deal, and I can see her jumping up at the back glass sliding door. It's covered by curtains, so I'm unable to see what might be out there. Well, guess what I did? Yup, I opened the curtains, and there he is. A guy in a hoodie, and a face covering, who's got his hands on the handle. I reached for a kitchen knife that's literally within inches of my grasp. This dude hightails it over my fence, disappearing into the night. Literally, as I'm about to call the cops, my neighbor texts me and asks me if I had seen someone jump over my fence. I called them and said there was someone trying to break into my home, and then I proceeded to get the cops. They never found them, which is a shame since I truly believe had it not been for Amber, I may have been caught off guard. I now have one of those ring cameras for my doorbell, and my dad helped me finance a security system, so along with Amber, I feel a lot more safe. Lock your doors. Okay, so judging by the title of my story, you're most likely thinking, well, duh, isn't that common knowledge? Yeah, yeah, it is. Should I lock my doors? Yes, I should. Do mistakes happen? And do you get caught up sometimes in the moment and you forget to lock said doors? It happens, and if it does, you're usually good. After all, the chances of someone just seemingly walking into your home are very unlikely, right? I mean, think about it. No normal person just goes up to a home and says, you know what would be great? Let me break in and proceed to rob this homeowner. All sarcasm and jokes aside, I want to take us back to last year when I made a very naive and dumb decision. It was roughly 7 p.m. I was in my kitchen getting ready to make some spaghetti for my wife and I to eat dinner. My wife was running a little bit late from work. She works at the post office, and every now and then she has to stay late to count stamps. I knew she was going to be tired, therefore explaining my kind gesture. But there was a problem. We had no more tomato sauce for the spaghetti. Well, there was a little, but surely not enough. So what do you know? I need to make a quick trip to the grocery store. A short three minute drive. So I grab my car keys, run out the front door, hop into my car, and I soon arrive. It's while grabbing the can of tomato sauce I ask myself, did I really forget to lock the front door? Yes, I did. Well, it's not like there was much I could do. Thankfully, there was no line, so I paid, hopped back into my vehicle, and got home, where things looked normal. Now, I should mention that my wife's co-worker was dropping her off at our home since her car was currently in the mechanic shop. That means the only way I would know if my wife was home was if I saw or heard her. Honey, I'm home, I shouted, as I can hear footsteps coming from our upstairs bedroom. I was expecting her to call back to me, but I met with no answer. Maybe she was going to take a shower. 
Whatever. I start boiling the pasta, and then my wife spooks me by entering through the kitchen door. Hey, I'm back. Man, what a long day. My feet are hurting, my wife said, as she comes up to me and gives me a kiss on the cheek. Wait a minute. Weren't you upstairs just now? No, I literally just walked in through the door. How could I be upstairs? What's up? Oh dear, did I have some explaining to do. But that's not a priority. I had to figure out why there was noise coming from the second story. I tell my wife to wait in the car, but she decides to join me, grabbing a kitchen knife in the process. Not even at the staircase, I decided to shout at the top of my lungs that whoever was in my home needed to leave because cops were already outside the door. I hoped I wouldn't hear anything, and I could have written all of this off as my imagination. But no. A man in a jumpsuit walked out from our bedroom, and he's got this look of confusion. I saw the door was left open. I'm here to do maintenance on your gas meter. I'm pretty sure everybody knows that the gas meter is supposed to be outside your home, not inside. I guess that was the best thing he could think of in the moment. I told him to leave, and he literally runs down the stairs and then out the front door. Now I know this isn't the most scariest story in the world, but it hopefully reminds you of what even leaving your house for a few minutes can do. By the way, when we went upstairs to our bedroom, we found a backpack filled with some of my wife's jewelry, and even some of my CD collection. Cookies salesman? I think not. This happened roughly three months ago, where I live in central New Zealand. I'm a big fan of yours, by the way. Nevertheless, it was a random evening at the beginning of July, and I was by myself playing Call of Duty with my friends on Xbox. Now, to quickly describe my home, it's one story, two rooms and one bathroom, and a small attic. The living room is right next to the front door, and next to the living room is the kitchen. In between both is a hallway which leads to the restroom and the bedrooms. Now, in order to get to the attic, you had to go into my parents' room, where in the closet there is an opening. It was mainly used for storage. But on the occasion, I would go up there with my friends, and we would tell scary stories, or play games. In any case, it must have been 10 or 11 p.m., and I heard the doorbell ring. I told my friends over Xbox I'd be right back, so I head over to see what the big deal was. I opened the main door, and through the screen door, there's a man in just your average ordinary street clothing. Sorry to bother you, but I'm selling chocolate and cookies. I'm trying to raise some money. Would you like to buy anything? Yeah, as if a kid was going to have money. I told him I had none, and I go to close the door. He, however, stops me and says that he wanted to talk more about the fundraiser he was doing. I could have honestly cared less, but he did offer to give me a free chocolate bar if I listened to him for a minute. Fair enough. I stood there listening to his story, but halfway through I heard a loud noise come from inside my home. The man suddenly drops the box and runs over to the side of my house. I was confused, but more so from the sudden crash. Little did I know, this so-called cookie and chocolate salesman was distracting me so his partner in crime could break into my home. From the living room, I see a whole bunch of broken glass, followed by two figures entering the home, one with a large baseball bat. I now realize the house was being robbed, so I do the only thing I could think of. I start booking it toward the attic. But that's not before I heard both of them yell at me to stop. That wasn't going to happen. I run into my parents' bedroom, lock the door, then go into the attic, where I must have waited for easily ten minutes for police to arrive. As I awaited their arrival, they broke into my parents' room, and I heard them say something like, Where'd that kid go? Ah, uh, who cares? Let's just grab what we can and let's leave. Obviously, that wasn't word per word, but they pretty much said something that told me they weren't really looking to cause harm. So, thanks, I guess. 
Things eventually went silent, and I heard them leave, but officers still hadn't arrived. Well, it turned out they ended up going to the wrong side of town, and it took them an additional 20 minutes just to get to me. By that point, those two were long gone, celebrating their successful cash-in of our valuables. In total, the back glass door was broken, my parents' bedroom door was busted, and a bunch of jewelry and money my parents had saved was stolen. It was easily around 8,000 New Zealand dollars, or as we like to call them, Kiwi dollars. I looked it up for my friends in the States, and it's about 5,000 US dollars. If you're wondering why my parents had so much money saved, it's because they were looking to put a down payment on a car, just using cash. Anyways, about a month later, officers investigated a couple of pawn shops and were able to find my mom's jewelry. When they looked at the security footage, they saw the two who had turned it in. They were the same two who had broken into my home, which I later confirmed when they talked to me about it. They were eventually caught, and they were put behind bars. Now, though my mom and my dad never got their cash back, my mom did get her jewelry, which to her was the most important, as it belonged to her mom, my grandma. Bonus Story Here's a bonus scary story for you all, as thanks for making it this far, as well as being patient with my uploading schedule. I live in Texas now, but this took place in California back in 1988. I used to live in San Jose, California, and I was a painter for a local painting company. One day, I was working at a new house on a tract site, and a scaffold builder came up and asked me if I was willing to paint his new home, which was also in a new housing tract, but about a hundred miles away. I agreed to go and give him an estimate, so we exchanged numbers and I made an appointment with him. Now, due to the house being out in the country, Far away from town, I charged him so high that I thought he'd find someone else, but he called me anyway about a month later, and since I was pretty greedy and fast, I decided to do the whole two-story home alone. I started inside, because the outside of the home still wasn't completed. Back then, I was still in my mid-twenties, and I've always been somewhat of a night owl. So, since I was taking the company truck home after my daily job instead of going home, I'd drive out of town towards this house in the boonies. It was the first and only home built on this tract, and every night I used to work until about 1am, and after about 3 weeks, I was almost done with the interior. Anyways, I was on the second floor touching up the railing banister, so my view was toward the downstairs living room and the dining room which led to the kitchen, which I couldn't see. Usually, I kept my radio loud and the doors were always opened while I worked. No other house was around or nearby. This night, I saw a shadow, and with all the flood lamps I had on, it was easy to make set shadows. However, I saw the person's shadow pass in the living area towards the kitchen, and I yelled, Painters upstairs! but I didn't get a response. And then, after a couple of minutes, I yelled out again, painters upstairs, nothing. I repeated that around two more times, with no response, but by now, I was finished touching up the railing. I went downstairs to look for the person responsible of the shadow, and expecting to see someone checking out of my work, I found no one. I then went outside, but I saw no vehicle. Even running around the perimeter of the home proved pointless. This is the moment I see it was after 1am, which meant it's time to pick up, clean, and go home. When I was walking back inside and up toward the stairs, I was thinking about what happened, and as I went up, I noticed that I also made a high shadow. But the creepy thing was that with about 15 floodlights, I made multiple shadows, but what I saw was only one shadow. Thinking about how creepy that was, I hurried and didn't pick up her wash, just closed up and locked everything and left. 
Since then, I always only worked right till before sunset, and I even hired another guy to help me. I got so scared that all of a sudden, greed didn't matter to me, and the guy I hired said that we could work until about 10pm if I wanted to, but for about 20 years, I never told anyone, fearing they'd think I was crazy. We eventually finished that paintwork, but I felt guilty about not telling the owners.